Hi, I'm Vivian Masters. I'm a senior at Manhattan College where I'm studying French and history. Last fall, I attended a seminar at which two Holocaust survivors shared their experiences and presented their video interviews with Manhattan College students. I was greatly moved by the strength and endurance of the two survivors and wanted to know how I could get involved with continuing the project to preserve their lives and stories. With the help and encouragement of Dr. Horn, I was selected to interview Lily Mazor Margulies, who lives in Riverdale, New York, with her husband Edward. I began by researching the Holocaust and reading the book that Lily had written about her life entitled Memories, Memories, From Vienna to New York, with a few stops along the way. With Holocaust survivors growing older, it is crucial that we record the truth of all that they endured. It is also a unique opportunity to be able to experience history through the hearts and souls of Holocaust survivors. Lily understands just how essential it is to pass on her stories, especially to young people, in the hopes that we may learn from all that she went through and grow to build a better world. It is for that reason that Lily visits schools, colleges, and teacher seminars to share her story. Lily is also the president of the Manhattan chapter of Women Holocaust Survivors and the editor of the publication Voice of the Woman Survivor. It was truly an incredible experience to be able to interview Lily, who is such a strong, intelligent woman who has been through so much and yet remains so optimistic and warm. Let us now listen to her story so that we may learn from and always remember her life and message. Lily Mazur Margulies was born in 1924 in Vilna, Poland, which is today Vilnius, Lithuania. Her father David was a pharmacist and her mother Gutta was a dentist. Lily and her younger sister Rachel enjoyed a happy and cultured upbringing in Vilna. There, Lily received the best possible education at a Jewish private school. In May 1939, the Mazur family endured a great loss when Lily's mother suddenly passed away. Just a few months later, Lily's life would change again. In September 1939, the Nazis took over Poland and her life would never be the same. Lily and Rachel were able to remain together throughout the trials they endured. They are survivors of the Vilna Ghetto, Kaiserwald concentration camp, Dunewerk slave labor camp, Stuttoff concentration camp, Steindorf slave labor camp, and the Dead March. Lily and her sister were finally liberated on March 11, 1945 by Russian troops in the small village of Kruma, East Prussia. Following their liberation, they recovered in Russian field and convalescent hospitals, joined a kibbutz in Poland, and were sent to displaced persons camps in Germany and Italy. In 1948, Lily, Rachel, and Lily's husband Edward immigrated to Argentina to live with their uncle Isaac. There, Lily's sons Michael and David were born. In 1956, Lily and her family moved to America to begin a new life in New York. Lily, can you tell me about your parents, family, and the town where you grew up? Yes. Well, I grew up in an ancient city uh, called Vilna. Today, this is called Vilnius, and it is uh, uh, the capital of Lithuania. But when I was born, it was uh, located at the northeastern Poland, and a slow flowing waters of the Vilia River. My father was a pharmacist, my mother was a dentist. Uh, also, I had a younger sister called Rachel, who lives now with her family in Buenos Aires, Argentina. A very important member of our family was our nanny. Her name was Victia, because my mother was the first liberated woman that I actually met. It was a very big accomplishment at this time for a woman to be a dentist. And since she worked full time, 
not the Aunani played, played very important part in our life. Uh, where did you go to school as a child? Um, I went to school to a private school for Jewish children. It was called Gymnasium Epsteina Ispeizera and it was located on the Archangelska 11th Street. It was an exceptional school. It was a really a very big privilege to be a student in this school and I was a happy-go-lucky uh, little student there. My mother passed away the 24th of May, 1939. She, she was never sick, but in one year, she, got, she just went away. How did your life and town change when the Nazis took over Poland in September 1939? When the German came in the beginning, uh, they, uh, they started to, to, first of all, Jews were not allowed to, uh, so, uh, to, to do any work that they, they were completely isolated. Later on, the streets were filled with uh, military trucks, and when they saw uh, a Jewish, a young Jewish boy or, or a, a young man, they would put them on the military trucks and take them away. And later we found out that they were taking them away to the killing fields of Punari, where they were just shot from the back. And they would fall into the massive graves. You see, when uh, the Germans took us into the ghetto, and it was on June 6, 1941. Uh, the conditions there were really horrible. First of all, the night before, they cleaned up a, a whole sector, section of our town, and it was a section where very poor people were living, and they took them, put them uh, on those uh, terrible tracks and they took them away never to be seen. So when we came from our homes and they took us to this place, it was really a very deviated old section of Vilna. In one room, we, there were three or four families. There was no running water. The conditions were really very, very bad. And also, we were starving. The rations that they gave us were so bad that after we lined up and when we came home with a piece of black bread and a container of some water, we, we really, on our way, we finished it. I decided that I have to do something because we were starving. So I got up very early in the morning and I went to this place and in the center of the ghetto and a German came and he was recruiting girls and maybe 200 of us were recruited with our, with our uh, Stars of David and he took us out. Suddenly the whole crowd stopped and as I looked up I could not believe my eyes. I was in front of my school. They took us in and they would find out that the Gestapo, Gestapo made, made the headquarters in the same school and there was an old, old cellar filled with old, with all kinds of frozen potatoes and I didn't even know that there, a cellar like this existed and they took us to this cellar and they told us to sort out those potatoes. I, as I was passing from, uh, from this, uh, to the entrance of this big cellar, there was the janitor of the school and his two daughters. And those two daughters, was, uh, the name was Kasia and Marisha, and those two daughters were always helping us because uh, when we were 
coming to school, we shared with them our lunches, they would help us um, to get dressed when we were still small. And we always considered them that they are our friends. And then suddenly I heard that one of the daughters said to the other, look, here is the little Lila. I thought that all the Jews from Vilna was killed already. Imagine how I felt that I was already condemned by somebody that was quote-unquote my friend. The liquidation of Vilna ghetto was September 23, 1943. And as it happens, my, uh, I was with my sister and my aunt, um, and there was a friend of my father that the night before, we didn't know it would be a liquidation, but the night before there were rumors that they wanted to close the ghetto. So he called us in and he said that he is made, building a secret room, and it was a, a, a very little space. and. He put a big armoire to the entrance, and then and we were standing up there, and then in the morning they found us. And the German also didn't want to do the, the dirty work, so there were the Ukrainian and the Lithuanian, and they came and they took us out. So they, they lined us up, and right away they separated men and women. And they took us out through, uh, through the, the big uh, door of the, of the Vilna, and this was the last time that I saw my city. I never went back. And they took us to a place called the Rosa Cemetery. It was a cemetery. When you came there, it was in September, end of September, it was a very, um, very sad uh, autumn day, and when you came there, you could feel the death lying over you, and, and just you could smell that these are our last moment. And then there was the selection: to the right, to live; to the left, to die; to the right, to live; to the left, to die to the right, able, young people, able, able um, bodies, and, and to the left, young mothers with children, old people, disabled people. As it happens, when I was walking, my aunt was in the center, and I was from the right side, and my little sister Rachel uh, was to the left, and my aunt, heard rumors that they taking away the children and they said they came to the setting them to the left. So she took off her shoes, high heel shoes, and she gave it to my little sister. She built up her bosom and and she put a little a rouge on on her cheeks. And she said to her, when did we come to the German? Straighten yourself up. Put yourself on the toe, on the toes, and when he asks you, how old are you? You say, I am 18 years old. And when we came there, he said to my sister, uh, to my little sister, how old are you? And she straightened herself out and she said, I am 18 years old. So he took me and my sister and pushed us to the right. And he pushed my aunt, who was my second mother who just propped up her little daughter. She should look older to the left. And we knew at this time that it was too, too dead. So I threw myself on those high, well-polished boots of this Gestapo man. And I started to cry. I said, I want to go with my mother. Don't, don't, don't do this. this. I want to go, this is my mother. So he pushed me, and with, with rifle he beat me, and he pushed me to the right, and he said to me, you have to work for the fatherland.
my father, I saw the last time when I was in the hospital before, when he was taken out from the pharmacy. And later on, I saw him in the Kaiserwald concentration camp. Because at this time, I was in a dinner labor camp. And the only way you could you could go to the concentration camp was if you had something, uh, a tooth, what uh, what's hurting you, and they had to the dentist would extract your tooth. So I was um, in the dinner camp, slave labor camp, and one of the girls came and told me, "Listen, I was yesterday at the dentist." You, you were not supposed to be sick. If you were sick, you were shot. The only thing that was tolerated if you have a toothache. So she says to me, I was yesterday in Kaiserwald to the dentist, and there was a man that came with a transport with men from Estonia. His name was David Mazur, and he was crying, and he was, uh, and he was uh, asking me if I heard about two little girls in Poland, my name was Lila, and my sister was Raya. Two little girls, Lila and Raya, because he heard that the Vilna ghetto was liquidated, and they were brought to Kaiserwald. So she, so I ran to to the person that was in charge of our barrack, and I put a piece of paper right here, and I said that I have a tooth today. And the next morning, I was brought by, uh, with other women, to the to Kaiserwald. And I was lurching around and looking where the transport from Estonia was. And I went to the barrack. It was dark there. And, I, and by, the, by the wall, I, went, I saw somebody that looked my, like my father, but I just, Somehow he was shorter, he was skinny. I just recognized him by his eyes. So he said to me that he is so happy that he can see me. And he said to me three things. First of all, he said, you are young and you will survive. Now we will meet in the pharmacy. Because by this time he was the owner of the pharmacy in a town called Sol, and he says, remember, he said, said, he said to me, you are the oldest sister. And then he said to me, the third thing, remember who your parents were, who your fa family is, bring me a good name. We were put on those cattle trains. And those cattle trains were so tight, we were pushed so tight that we were, in the morning, when they would open the doors to, to let us out, it, there were a lot of people that were dead, and there was no place for them to fall. It, we were, the only thing in the scuttle train was in the center of the train. It was a very big wooden vat filled with the disinfectant. There was no privacy. They, they didn't give us food. They treated us worse than the cattle. So when we came out, we could hardly stand on our feet. We were very weak. And this was the first time that I met an animal called the SS woman. And the SS woman was a young, blonde girl, German, very buxom, with a very tight uniform, with a very um, with well-polished high boots, and she also had a, crab, a, a horse crab, and she had a dog, a, a, a German shepherd. But the, the part of that was really un incomprehensible was that she was so brainwashed that a lot of young girls from my town were beautiful girls, blonde girls. They were Jewish, but they were blonde girls with beautiful blonde, uh, blue eyes. And when she saw somebody, a girl, 
counted. First of all, they always told us to line up and they were counting us. But when she saw in a line up, when she saw a beautiful Jewish girl, she would beat her up with the crap because they were brainwashed and they were told that all Jews are smelly, they are dirty, they are, they are not uh, entitled to live as human beings. So, so this poor girl was just getting luscious because she looked like a beautiful girl. In Kaiserwald, after we arrived, they lined us up and they told us to get undressed. And we were naked, standing there. And then, like a herd of cattle, they put us in a very big room, hermetic. The doors were hermetic closed. And then, to our horror, we saw that in, that in the in the ceiling there were like shower of uh, shower uh, heads and, and when we were in, in the Vilna ghetto we heard rumors about uh, gassing and we heard rumors that people are being burned in in big uh, ovens so when we, we when we saw their uh, those openings, we were sure that we were being gassed right there, that gas will come any moment from there. Uh, and this is our last moment on this earth. Uh, people were crying, women were crying, there were a lot of mothers and daughters, sisters, and as I was standing there under this head, I was just praying one thing. I want to be the first one to fall. I couldn't imagine that my little sister will be cast and she will fall dead. And it was a, a very uh, sad atmosphere. Pe people were crying, people were his, women were hysterical. And then suddenly a miracle happened because from those little shower opening, cold water started to come out. And so we were drinking the water, we were washing ourselves, we didn't have soap. But then we found out that they decided that this transport of young girls and women from Vilna Ghetto came. They decided that they needed to send to labor camp, to slave, stay in labor camp. I, I didn't stay there too long because one day as we were staying right there in the on the appel on the on the roll court they came a German came and he was uh, looking for women to take them to dinner labor camp slave labor camp and my sister and I were chosen to go there. So they took us to Dinaverken, slave labor camp. I didn't mention, but Kaiserwald and Dinaverken were located in Latvia, near Riga. Riga was the capital of Latvia. So this is the place where we were there. So from there, they took us to Dinaverken. Dinaverken was a, a slave labor camp that was located on the Red Donau River. In comparison to Kaiserwald, Dinaverke was a much, much better place for us because at least over there, we, the, the, condition, the, the sleeping conditions were, very, were better. The portions were not good, but the sleeping conditions were better. Right there, we became very friendly with two sisters, and one of the sisters, was writing poetry and she was writing beautiful, beautiful poetry and despite that we were in such a, a difficult conditions, after she was, we were also collecting paper for her and she would write the poetry and, and many times we would sing it and just to, to, to bring a little sunshine into those very, very 
dull and difficult lives. Uh, they liquidated the camp and they took me to Stutthof labor camp, uh, concentration camp in East Prussia. Stutthof concentration camp was a really nightmare. The conditions there were abhorrent. From Dinaverke to Stutthof, they took us on barges and the bar that I was, the, somehow we made it, but there were one or two barges that they were burned right there with the prisoner right there. So it is a very, very dark part of the history, the way they treated us. Stutthof, let me repeat, was a nightmare. The, the condition there we were really abhorrent and also we saw the crematoria there and we could, you could smell and also you could see the Belgian ovens with the dark, with the dark uh, smoke. Um, one day we were standing on the countless appeals, roll calls, and a German came over and he said he is looking for people and he chose me and my sister. He sent us from Stutthof to Steindorf labor camp. Steindorf labor camp was something that is very hard to comprehend because we were practically sleeping on raw floor, earth. We worked there, um, they were nearby a camp of men and they were cutting the wood in the woods and we had to, to bring big chunks of wood. It was really very, very hard work and we were so hungry that sometimes we were going, passing by, it was, it was already autumn. And it was very cold. We would pass by fields where there were frozen potatoes or frozen uh, other vegetables that even a cow wouldn't eat. And people were so hungry, they would run. And as soon as they ran to take this frozen potato, they were shot. After the liquidation of Steindorf, I believe you went back to the yes. concentration camp? Uh, yes. They, uh, it was it was the time that um, they did need us, so they sent us back to Stutthof. When we came to Stutthof, it was just after a very big epidemic of typhoid. And if we would be in Stutthof at this time, we would never made it. But a miracle happened. The Germans lost at Stalingrad. And after this, the invisible German army started to fall apart. And there was, they had a very big problem. What to do with thousands and thousands prisoners, those from the concentration camp? So then, the march that I call the March of the Living Dead started. And the only way you could survive if you were in the front, if you were in the, in the back, those frustrated German guards would shoot you without a mercy. During this time, I was very friendly with other girls, with those two girls. One of them was the poet that I mentioned, and there was another girl. And we became like supporting ourselves and one and we became very very close sometimes when one of us was falling apart the other one was just kind of talking and, and helping and we were always trying to walk in the front one of the girls a beautiful young girl suddenly started to leave and 
I was holding her from one side, and my other friend holding, were holding her from the other side, and we were really trying to push her, and the guard shouldn't see that something is wrong with her. But after two days, he took her out. And the fields, it was East Prussia, the fields were covered with snow because it was in the middle of the winter of 1945. The march started in January, February. And so imagine the cold and, and also and the cold and, the, and we were sleeping each night in a different barn. And going back to this girl, he took her around and on the snow-covered field and shut her in front of us. This girl was the only one that had a little coat with a rabbit color, and all of us were practically freezing. My feet, my toes became black, and they were sun, snow, uh, snow frozen and my legs were all covered with open wounds and my shoes were falling apart. After he shot her, he said to us, she has this warm coat, one, go and get us, you are freezing there. And this was an act of resistance that I, that I took part. Nobody, not one woman, not one girl, went over and took the coat. We were just afraid to, to cry out, so we were crying on the inside. And the tears were frozen on our face. And many, and nobody, nobody took the, this coat from this girl. Many times during the march, I would see young girls frozen, falling flat on the snow. We on March 10th, we were walking the whole day and the whole night, and in the morning on March 11th. It was just very, very early in the morning. We came to a place called Kruma in East Prussia. And they took us in a very big barn that belonged to a Nazi who escaped. And in this, when we took, they took us in the barn, my sister and I, we just sat down by the wall. And we were in, in such a bad shape that, that we really were asking God to take us away because we couldn't take it anymore. This was the first time that I met male prisoners after a long time because we were all segregated. And one of the prisoners, a man, threw a piece of dark old bread for us. And I was, we were trying to distribute it. We were sitting and chewing on, chewing on. And as I was sitting by the wall, through an opening, I saw something that I could not believe. I thought that I am hallucinating. I saw the, the Nazis putting piles of wood around the bar. And then the rumor started. They don't know what to do with us. They were us alive. Because they were just desperate, nervous, and they were just looking for any excuse to get rid of us. And we were sitting there, and believe it or not. We didn't care. We just wanted the death should come as soon as possible. So they were sitting there chewing his bread. And suddenly we heard a very big commotion outside the barn. We heard the dogs barking. We heard the shots, and then there were horses. There was a very big commotion. 
to look at seeking death. But the man that was more adventurous opened the door of the barrel and he started to scream, the Russians are coming, the tanks are coming, we are free, and we didn't believe it. We didn't move. But the man started to go out and, the, and after a while the barrel was practically empty and I and my sister and those two of our friends, we were, we were the last one to live there and I had a very big problem. As I mentioned before, my feet, were, my toes were black and I didn't have a pair of shoes. So one of the girls found a piece of cardboard. So there I was standing on the snow because it was March and it was very cold. Be barefoot without shoes on this piece of cardboard and they didn't know what to do with me and then suddenly the Russian tanks started to come closer and the from the first tank a Russian soldier, a young soldier, jumped down, he took off his sh shoes and he ran to this guard and he dead guard and he took off his beautiful black boots and he put them on, and those guards took such a pride in those boots, they were punishing them. They were, they were spending hours just to make them uh, clean and beautiful. And then he noticed that I stand with my black toes on this piece of cardboard, so he threw his sh soldier shoes to me. And this little gesture saved my life, because I was I put the shoes on and he, the tongue started to go and, and, and I could walk on the snow. So, March 11, 1945, I call it my day of triumph. So ever, as we were standing there, we didn't know what to do, suddenly we saw this Hungarian doctor coming towards us. She recognized me, she knew me, and she had uh, uh, she put a red, uh, a red, a bent, a red cross, and she said to me, listen, this is a very chaotic situation. The Russian soldiers are running around looking for girls. There are no Nazis, there are no police. You just sit someplace, put a babushka, and sit someplace in the corner. They shouldn't see that you are young girls. And in the morning, I heard the Russians are organizing a field hospital and they are opening a typhoid ward. So you just sit there, put, put those over your head, nobody should see you, and in the morning I will come with a horse and buggy and I will take you to the hospital. And this what happened. It was a very long night and she came with a horse and buggy. And there were a lot of other girls already there, and she took us to the field hospital, to this ward. And this typhoon ward, there were 50 of us, and there was only one nurse. Vilna, this time, was under Russians, so they considered that, they, uh, that we are their responsibility. So they sent us to a place called Sopot, in North, uh, North Poland, where they confiscated a very big house and it was a mansion from the Nazis and they make like like um, a recuperating center, you know, where they recuperate. And I was in a very, very bad shape. It took me a whole year till I recuperate mentally and physically. After they, uh, they let us out from the convalescent home, we had to go to a certain place and they made us papers uh, and, and uh, we decided, that first of all, we decided to inquire if our father is still alive. So we were traveling uh, always um, with the babushka um, and, um, through the trains, we had our documents and we came to a city in Poland called Lodz and over there to our surprise, on the railroad station, we heard people speaking Yiddish, speaking Polish. So, so we saw, oh, there are other people. There
that survived. As, as I was staying there on the railroad station, suddenly a girl ap appeared and she said to me, Oh, uh, 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 you know that your cousin is here. So this girl took us to this, uh, to, to our uh, cousin. And of course she was very, very happy and this was the first time that we had a nice bed, uh, hot bath and we ate a beautiful supper and also she put us the first time, I remember, in, in a white clean bed. It was such an experience, we could not believe it. And, and she and her brother didn't know what to do with us. So they said, you know, there is a kibbutz. There are a lot of orphans, there are people, and they're preparing them to go to Israel. So when I came, so they took us the next morning there, and when I came there, I was a walking, uh, a walking, a ghost. I was really looking so bad that, that the guy that was in charge of the kibbutz didn't want to accept me. He thought that tomorrow I would die. I was just in a very bad shape, so I, I, they were very disappointed. But then he said, she said to me, tell me, from where are you? I said, I am from Vienna. He said to me, you are from Vienna? My girlfriend escaped to Vienna from Lodz, and she was in Vienna ghetto. And it, and when, I, when he started to ask me, these two girls, that these two sisters, that one of them was a poet, one of the sisters was his girlfriend. So I started to tell him that we were together there and together there. And so he had pity on me. So he accepted me, let me to keep it to the kibbutz. This kibbutz, was preparing us to go to Israel. And so we went uh, from, uh, we didn't have papers, so we were just wandering. We were in Germany and then they sent us near Munich. There was a, a very big Nazi farm that was liquidated, uh, to, taken away and we learned how to milk cows, how to work, you know, and, yeah, and this farm, uh, really it was the time that I started to come to, to myself. On our way to Israel, we were crossing the Alps, and it was quite an experience because it was um, New Year's, um, and it is especially it was a very, very dangerous uh, undertaking because we were brought uh, from G from Germany to to Prague to to uh, to one side was Austria and the other side was Italy and they wanted to bring us to the depicts of of Italy. The depicts are displaced uh, persons uh, camps. And from there, they, they would send us um, to Israel. So I didn't know about it, but my husband was also crossing the Alps the same night, and his sister-in-law gave a bag, a bag of cookies, and I ate of one of those cookies, but I didn't know. Later on, when I uh, when I uh, met him and he told me, I found out that I was one of the of this, but I, it was a very, very treacherous uh, um, climbing in the middle of the night in the snow, and finally uh, somehow we made it and we came to the other side. And I was in a DP camp, the, in two DP camps. One was uh, near Tur Turin, it called Glasgow, and the other one was near Milan. Uh, uh, it was called Adriatica. Uh, uh, I was in a kibbutz and my husband was in a different kibbutz. So we met in a DP camp in, near Turin uh, in, uh, in Italy.
uh, I married my husband three months after I knew him because he was in a different kibbutz and I was in a different kibbutz and my kibbutz got orders to, to go to, uh, to uh, Genoa and to, uh, to go to Israel. Did you stay in Italy? We, we stayed in Italy one, uh, the whole year, but the whole time I was always looking for my father. So suddenly, as I, as I came to this, uh, to this place, I put a note that we are looking for my father, and then, it, I don't know, it occurred to me, maybe we have a, a, an uncle in Buenos Aires. So I just put the dead. Uh, uh, a note that um, the two Mazur sisters are looking for their uncle in Buenos Aires, and I put J. Mazur, and if anybody knows about him, uh, please let him, let us know, and we are in a DP camp in, uh, near Torino. And this Italian guy said that your uncle in Buenos Aires is looking for you, and he wants what can he do for you? And he wants you to come immediately to there. He will make you the proper papers. And we didn't want to come because we were decided that if we survive and there is a Israel, this is our duty to build Israel. So he wrote us that, look, you are after such a big deal. Just come for one year to Buenos Aires. And then later on you go to Israel. But it was a very big problem because the Nazis could come and go to, to Buenos Aires. But Jews were not allowed to come. So my uncle went to uh, immigration uh, attorney and he gave him a blank check. And he said there are three people. He was very unhappy that I was married already. But he said, I have three people in the DP camp in Europe. This is a blank check. How much will it cost? I want you to bring them. So he brought us over on as Episcopalian. Uh, when we came to Buenos Aires, he became our second father. He opened, he rented us a, a, an apartment. On the third day when we came, my husband went to work. So we didn't, and uh, all the money that he gave us, we gave him to the penny back. So this is how we land up in Buenos Aires. We came to New York because my my husband had a sister and a brother here. I didn't want to leave Buenos Aires. I was very comfortable there. The children were very precious for me when they said that they have, there is a good future in America. I couldn't say no. You see, I, in the back of my mind, I always had this idea that my father wanted me to be a doctor. But when I came to America, first of all, I wanted to learn the language, and second, I had to adjust myself, and I had two small children. So I was waiting, but I wanted very much to further my education. The only thing that I could do in medicine was to become an X-ray technician. And this was the only, the only thing that was available at this time in medicine, and I felt that all this to the memory of my father. So I am doing this interview. Not, it is because I want for the young people to build a better world. I want them to understand that a human being is no matter what, he is a human being. There is a saying, love, love your neighbor like you love yourself. And this, if you would love your neighbor like you like yourself, we would live in a beautiful world.